moved to retirement. Yeah. They've been here almost three months. Well, because remember, he was living in the house. Yeah. 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 All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we have 6.30 on the top, so we are going to uh, get moving right along. So, uh, last time I did a class, I didn't have a start and an end date, so I figured it's better to have a start and an end date, because then I can't talk for forever. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Y'all say that easily, but not on Sunday, huh? Uh, anyway, so Methodism 101, uh, if you have been in one of my classes before, or if you haven't, welcome. And you get to now hear my ridiculousness, which is, I need a couple of people to give a God moment from the last 83.62 hours. I didn't know math was involved. The last 83.62 or six, two hours, whatever I said. Any God moments from the last, like, three days? Anyway. Four days. I woke up. Woke up this morning. Amen. Hey, that's one. Yep. I had my board of ministry interview today. And? It was intense. <laughs> <laughs> but it went well. It went, it went well. well. They, yeah. they approved me. Yeah. And I, they said, uh, they asked all these questions about 10 people in the room. They, these very really deep questions. And so they said, I need to leave and they want to vote. And I, so I said, but when I come back, do I get a rose like The Bachelor? <laughs> <laughs> I think it still approved me. They said they they of them didn't know the reference. <laughs> Patrick's so boring. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I've had some real down days in a row. Mm. And uh, I've always had a special bond with my daughter. And it's like we don't even need to say anything. And I was really feeling bummed. Next thing I know, my phone's ringing, and it's my daughter. Aww. And she can talk me out of being bummed better than anybody. <laughs> That's great. So I else have one? Just one more.
then you really don't want to be here for that last one. Um, because we're going to talk about a few things. I know a lot of y'all have lived through that in some form or fashion, either at this church or a different one. Um, but we're not going to talk about it in terms of um, kind of the, what the national stories are that they run in the press, because that's the sensationalized version. We'll talk a little bit about theology and about some of the reasons behind things. And then also I want to help y'all to understand what are some of the key differences about being in this denomination versus being in a, in a different, in the United Methodist Church. Um, so part of that is uh, I'm an elder in the Mid-Texas Conference, but I am also the communications director for the Mid-Texas Conference, and I'm on the board of directors. So for our area, um, just I'm one, I, got, I got on those boards, I don't know how. Um, but I just want you to be able to know some of the differences, some of the similarities, all that good stuff. Uh, that's in church world we call that polity, the way your church is governed. Um, so if I ever say a big word that you're like, I have no clue, just come and stop and be okay. Uh, so to start off with, my curiosity is, I asked this last time, I thought it was interesting, I won't ask it yet. What denominations have you been a part of? What denomination did you grow up in? I know, at least if you grew up in this church, so Methodist. Yeah, okay. Methodist. Or, or a different Methodist church. Uh, Luther. Uh, Luther. Uh, my uh, stepfather and his uh, parents were Luther, and uh, so I was put to the Lutheran church. And at uh, about the age of 12, we were Anglican. Yeah. And y'all been Lutheran? Over, over 30 years. Started off Catholic. And I told my mom I went to Lutheran. She says, well, you're going to hell. <laughs> See you there, mom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so we're, which, were you on Missouri Synod? Okay, well, we've been part of both, but mostly okay. Missouri Synod. Uh, Presbyterian. Presbyterian. Uh, Baptist. 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 Non-denominational. <clears throat> Eva. I was non-denominational, but I'm pastor for Pentecostal. Okay. Non-denominational Pentecostal. 33 years Baptist, 20 years Pentecostal. Yeah. So, just coming from a wide variety of, what was your denomination before this? Remind me, there was a name for it. Well, it was called the World Wide Church of God. That's right. Okay. Before that, it was Radio Church of God. Radio Church of God? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know if you ever heard of the name of Amy Semple McPherson. She started the Four Square Church, uh, and she was, I don't know what her church's name was in uh, Los Angeles, but she was the first pastor in like the 19 teens to use radio for Christian ministry. And because she was in the Los Angeles area, um, she would get uh, Hollywood designers to build her like illustrated sermon sets. So when she would do a sermon, she'd have these outlandish, crazy movie sets. And uh, just a fascinating character to look into if you ever want to. And she was part of the Assemblies of God, part of the Pentecostal movement, and then um, she kind of walked out of it. And so you know, she started the Four Square Church, uh, which is a more West Coast, Northern denomination. Uh, so here's what I want you to just think about, and I'm going to give you just about a minute uh, Melissa and Pearl, you're going to have to kind of lean over to somebody else's table. But I just want you to look at your table and just, if you had to kind of distill your experience in blank denomination, what would be one, maybe two t key takeaways that you would have taken away from that denomination? Like when you think about, uh, this is how I would say it, if you had to distill down, you know, blank's theology down to two key characteristics, what would it be? So, um, for example, somebody might say, in, if you were Roman Catholic, one of the key characteristics of the Roman Catholic Church is you uh, submit to the authority of Rome and to the Pope. Um, in the Pentecostal Church, it might be that you are saved and then you have a second uh, experience of grace with uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Does that help? Okay, so just look at, look at your group real quick. Are you in the hall for it? But look at your group, look at your group, and just for just two or three minutes, tell them what's, what's just like an experience you had, something you took away 
from that denomination, something you think maybe they're known for, just something like that. It can be Methodist, it can be Lutheran, whatever you grew up with. So, two or three minutes, look at your table, and talk about that real quick. Lutheran, you're saved by grace. Not by works, but by grace. That's Martin Luther.
because that's a Charles Wesley hymn. Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Charles, Charles Wesley hymn. Um, I made a sing it several months ago, and now I can't remember the name of it. Anyway, there's, he wrote like 1,000, 2,000 hymns. And, I'm sorry? I said, whoa. Oh, so he, he wrote a lot. Um, and, you know, one of the funny things about the Methodist movement is you have all these hymns that were written, and, you know, they're written in meter, so they have a, a way that they're sung, or the way that they're phrased. Um, and so you can kind of move with any tune you want to. So one of the things that kind of attracted people to the early Methodist church was you might have gone to a bar on Saturday and heard a song, and then you went to church on Sunday, and you went, I know that song because I know the tune. Now I just know new words. I know new words. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, John Wesley was uh, born in England in the, in the 1700s, and John was born to Samuel and Susanna Wesley. Samuel was an Anglican priest. John would eventually become an Anglican priest. And Susanna was from a non-conformist background. Uh, basically, at this time in England, you were either Anglican, you know, Henry VIII established the Anglican Church, which was basically Catholic, but we don't have the Pope, Henry VIII the Pope. And then one of his kids said, no, we're going back to the Catholic Church. And then one of the, you know, one of the other kids said, no, we're saying the Protestants. And then they fought and fought and fought until eventually they decided, no, everybody has to be uh, Anglican or you have to declare yourself non-conforming. You're non-conformist. So you can't be buried in the same cemeteries. You might have to pay special tax, things like that. And uh, basically, Susanna was a, uh, she was just a lady who probably is more in line with our current Methodist theology because as a, as a mom, I think she had like 17 kids. And I think six survived to adulthood. Um, so this is a fun book by one of my professors in seminary. And it talks about the, uh, the influence of family dynamics in the life and ministry of John Wesley. And the first chapter, what she read is, there was a baby whose name was John Wesley, died. There was a baby whose name was Benjamin Wesley, died. There was a baby whose name was Benjamin John Wesley, died. There was a baby named uh, John Benjamin Wesley, died. And then there's John Benjamin Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church. So to start off with, he's like a fifth, uh, fifth time, you know, what's the word when you have a baby after a baby has passed away, like a replacement baby. It's, it's kind of a rainbow baby, whatever, whatever it's called. He's got a lot of baggage already just in his name because his family was trying to honor all those other children that had passed. Um, and so lived in a large family, then as a nonconformist. And Samuel is basically, he's a priest, but he sucks. Excuse me, he's not good at it. Sorry. <laughs> I've locked my mind. Samuel is not good at it, but he deals with that all the time. He builds this giant, beautiful house at Epworth they absolutely cannot afford. Gets thrown into Debbie prison. Gets out of Debbie prison eventually, does something else, gets thrown into it again. And so as he's going back and forth to Debbie's prison, Susanna says, you've left the parish, which is... Uh, you know, in England, it's not just a parish church, it's a parish community, because this community goes to this church. So you've left the parish without a priest, somebody's got to fill in the void. So she started to. So eventually, Susanna had uh, a Bible study going in her uh, kitchen, and I think she had at one point like 70 people going to this Bible study. And there's all these letters back and forth from him to her and her to him when he was in Devers prison. And he said, stop it, you're a woman, you can't do these things. And she said, I'll stop doing it when you do your job. <laughs> and so that was, that was who Susanna was. <coughs> and Susanna was also very well known for having, um, I think it was six or seven kids that had survived. So she had, each kid had their own day. She would be with that child, focus specifically on that child. Um, and I've been in the house that they lived in in Epworth, and she had this special chair that, it's a normal chair, and then you flip the back down, and you can use the seat to kneel on for prayer. And you can see, actually, the indentations from the seat from where her knees would have been, because she spent that much time in prayer over the years in this chair. So she's a very, a very uh, religious person, and Samuel is too. He's just, he's got some problems. Um, and so in 1709, Possibly because Samuel 
made some comments and did some things he shouldn't have done, their house burns down mysteriously. Or maybe somebody burned it down. Um, and so this is actually a picture of John Wesley. You can see the, the child up there in the window. Um, and he was pulled out of the house fire by a human ladder. Uh, and he was declared that night to be a brand plucked from the burning, which is also um, Isaiah. I think it's in Isaiah uh, or Jeremiah. There's a, there's a scripture about that as well. So this became kind of a, a life verse for John Wesley that he would he would kind of return to a lot. That God obviously had something special intended for him because not only was he a replacement child for all of these kids who had died and he had to live up to that, but now he had been plucked from the burning of this house. So uh, John Wesley goes to Oxford, kind of follows in the steps of his dad, and at Oxford, uh, he gets his degree from Oxford, and he becomes a fellow at Christ Church, essentially he's one of the professors. Uh, and while he's at Christ Church, really when he's a fellow, um, they start to develop the Holy Club. And the Holy Club was just designed to be a group of people that work together to work out that, their salvation, to do things together, to... Uh, spur one another on to good works, all the things. And because they had such a rigorous schedule, they were called Methodists. They were so methodical, they got annoyed by it, and so they were the Methodists. And that was a derogatory phrase that eventually they, they took on for themselves. So what it looked like was Monday, Wednesday, Friday, they did certain things. Tuesday, Thursday, they did certain things. Saturday, they did certain things. Sunday, of course, was the Lord's Day you spent in church. And so on some days, like Tuesdays and Thursdays, they would have not piety days, but piety days, where they're focusing on works of piety. That's works of inward uh, spiritual growth, spiritual maturity. On other days, they would have works of mercy days. So, you know, John was used to going to the prison once a week. He was used to going to the poorhouse once a week. He was used to all these different things. And on certain days, he knew, this is what I'm going to go do. This is who I'm going to go minister to, all that kind of stuff. Um, so he's, he's doing actually quite a lot of things. He's involved in this holy club. He's attending uh, the Anglican Mass regularly. He is studying to become a priest. Eventually he becomes an Anglican priest. And he is doing all these works of mercy and all these works of piety. And, and he is just, I mean, if you could say, this is what a Christian in this day and age should look like, he's doing it. And the problem is, is that he's struggling with assurance. So, all of Wesley's life, if you have to say there's one word that defines him, it's assurance. And assurance simply means uh, it's confidence in salvation. It's the knowledge that I know that I am saved. Um, so again, I want you to read your group really quickly, just two or three minutes. Uh, maybe share a little bit about when you became a Christian and received Christ in your life. Um, if you notice any differences, I know for some of us we've been a Christian long as we can remember, probably feels like since we're in our mama's belly. But um, if you have been a Christian your whole life or kind of wandered through the church, what differences did you notice before and after your conversion? And then the big one, how do you know that you're saved today? What maybe tangibles do you know that help you to know that you are saved today? Okay? So I'm going to leave this up here. Look at your group. Two or three minutes. Go ahead. And then help start with it. When did you become a Christian? How did you become a Christian? That might be a little easier to uh, answer. I never had a moment. I mean, I grew up Catholic, Lutheran. I never had that problem. Just always considered myself. I'm saying because I got a cash 
obligation and do the sacraments. So do you know why uh, we call them Christ or Christians or uh, Christ or Christmas Easter Christians? People who only show up those two days? CEO. Christians. Yeah, Christians. CEO. <laughs> but do you know why you call them that? Because those are the two holy days of obligation for the Catholic Church. You have to go Christmas and Easter, or it used to be that way. Um, and so that's kind of where that first started, was the Catholic Church saying you have to go to confession and get mass at least twice a year where that first came from. And now it's just because those are the two biggest things and that's when most people come anyway, but that's where it originally started. So in the Presbyterian Church, one of the things they would say, uh, remember, I think I've said it before, we as Methodists are Arminian. Arminius is Jacob Arminius. He's a uh, theologian who said that if you have the choice to uh, accept God, you have the choice to reject God. Um, the, the tree is in the garden of Eden not because they are forced to eat from the tree, but because they are allowed to eat from the tree. Were the tree not there, they could not choose to willingly love God because they can't choose to not love God. You can only choose to love someone when you have the choice to not love them. Um, so my joke is Beauty and the Beast. Can Beauty love the Beast before he releases her? I would say no because she doesn't have the choice. Uh, and then all my theologian friends look at me and they go, that's the worst analogy I've ever heard in my life. And I say, no, it's to you, it works. Uh, <laughs> now, in a, in a Baptist church, in a Calvinist church, in a Presbyterian church especially, they believe in um, the five points of Calvinism. Some Baptist churches don't. Uh, but one of the five points of Calvinism, there's a unique anagram for it, it's tulip, like flower. Um, total depravity. Ooh, I'm not going to do this. Never mind. I can't do this. Uh, one of them is the perseverance of the saints. Or as you might have heard it called, one saint, all the saints. Um, so if you are a Christian, if you're attending church regularly, if you're living a Christian life, that is one of the ways that you know that you are assured of your salvation. That you are living in such a way that you are uh, clearly one of the elect. Now, somebody might say, how do I know if I'm one of the elect? And they would say, well, because you act like it. And they would say, okay, so then my, my salvation comes from my works. Well, no. Okay. Well, then what if I am one of the elect, but I don't live like it? Well, then you're not one of the elect, because obviously it would, it would play itself out. Um, I don't know if that helps all. I think that's a funny kind of reality. 
one of the ways that we, we think about assurance often is we, is we go to Romans 8, 15, and 16. Uh, this is from the New King James Version, just because I really think it has the best verses or wording here. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage yet to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So in uh, the entire Christian tradition, everybody holds to, if you are a Christian, God's spirit testifies to your spirit that you are saved. Um, and now some people have the gift of assurance, the spiritual gift of assurance that I know I'm saved, I've never thought about twice. I know it. Some people don't have that spiritual gift and they have to lean into that um, and they have to really kind of work on their assurance. And, and that's not to say that the works do anything, but it's to say that, you know, you have to, it's like a muscle. If you don't have exercise, you atrophy. Um, but anyway, so that's kind of the scripture that we go to. And that's the scripture that, again, really is one of John Wesley's overarching, this defined his life. Um, that the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So Wesley's concern was, how do I know that I'm saved? Well, for Wesley, the Anglican Church is a big tent, but leans, leans kind of heavily towards Calvinism, um, which is the historic position of the church. We as Arminians that say you can choose God or reject God are actually in the minority of Christian traditions. Um, you know, Wesley's kind of in this Calvin-ish uh, denomination. And so he's walking this tightrope of, I have to do good works because uh, the Bible calls us to do good works. But are my good works what assures me of my salvation? How do I know I have this relationship with God? He's struggling with this all the time. And, and he, uh, he started writing a journal that, I don't know, in my office I have volumes like 1 through 8 of the 63 published volumes, and probably none of them are smaller than this book, of his journals. Not his sermons, not his writings, his journals. Because he was so methodical, he would write down 7 a.m., got up and had breakfast, well, 4 a.m., got up and had breakfast, prayed for three hours, 7.05 a.m. I got mad at somebody and now I feel like I'm a sinner and I'm going to hell. 7.06 a.m. I got mad at myself for being mad at myself so now I know I'm going to hell. And that's, that's literally who he was. If you know the story of Martin Luther, maybe, then you know that Luther also struggled with assurance. And Luther, uh, because he was Catholic, had a priest who was taking his confession and eventually it got to the point that he was in there for so long that the priest taking his confession was like, dude, Get out. Just give me a break. Go to someone else. You're okay. You're not going to hell. You've been absolved. And he was just like, no, I still don't know if I've not, you know, given you everything that I've done wrong. Uh, so he's, he's walking this high line of works and grace. And so Wesley decides, you know, hey, one of the ways that obviously I'm going to grow in my faith is I'll go be a missionary, right? That's how you grow in your faith. So he goes to Georgia. Um, and he becomes a missionary in the, United, or in the British colony, but he becomes the United States. Um, and as he is going to the uh, Georgia colony, there are some Moravians, which is a German denomination of Christians. And he's sitting on this boat with them, and it's really rocky, and it's a really horrible storm. And, and they all think they're going to drown. Everybody's screaming and crying and wishing their mommy was there. And the Moravians are singing hymns, they're praying, and they're just calm. And when they're asked why, they say, eh, ship goes down, we know where we're going. We're okay. And so Wesley, that, that impresses Wesley. They have assurance. There's something different about these people. Um, but he gets, to, he gets to the new world, and he sits there, and he starts saying, you know, well, I'm going to go talk to these Indians, and I'm going to get them to be Christians. And the problem is, is that Indians in general aren't very interested in the white man religion. Uh, because... They're not being super treated well by everybody there. They're kind of being seen as inferiors and, um, you know, held to kind of a low intellectual ability. And so he's struggling with that. And then John Wesley starts his helpless quest for love. 
Um, again, in this book, I, I think it's really funny because as I was reading it the first time, um, he's got like three or four women in his life that he's strung along. And he's going to get married, everything's going to be great, and then it didn't happen. The woman that he finally married at, later in his life never had kids. And he was so dismissive of her. I don't believe they ever got divorced because I don't think they could. But, I mean, they were separated, I think, a few months, a few years after they got married. And they never lived together again. They made it that divorce, though. Uh, and so, John Wesley meets this woman whose name is Sophia Hopke. Sophie Hopke. And he says, oh, I love you. We're going to get married. And she goes, great. When? Soon. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually, she's tired of soon. And she gets married to another guy. Well, John Wesley is her priest. And he decides she has committed a grievous sin by marrying this dude. Okay? So what does a priest have the ability to do? Deny you access to the communion table. Problem is, this is the state church. Denying you access to the communion table, if it's not justly done, can be a chargeable offense. So John Wesley leaves Georgia as a criminal because he decides he can't give her communion. The governor of Georgia gets involved, decides, no, you can't do that. You have to serve them. He refuses. He issues an arrest warrant. John Wesley leaves. So the founder of the Methodist Church is a uh, felon. Uh, <laughs> so he leaves America and he says, I went to America to convert the Indians, but who shall convert me? He still is just struggling and struggling and struggling with his assurance. So the question becomes, you know, what role do works play in our salvation? Um, what, in what way are they meritorious? Do they get us anything? Um, can you be a Christian and not have good works? Those are kind of the questions that, that I'm wanting us to think about for just a moment. So um, instead of having you do table conversation, let's do it all together real quick. Um, does anybody kind of want to take a stab at, at one of those top three questions? What role do works play in our salvation? Are works at all meritorious? In parentheses, they give us something. And can you be a Christian and not have works? Anybody? I'll go with the last. person studying to be a pastor. Yes. What role do works play in our salvation? I think that works don't earn your way into heaven. But there's, but they, as a Christian, you should want to do good works because you have been changed. And so I think that's what the role is. Yeah, I kind of agree with but salvation is given by God. Works have nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. But like you were saying, once you get the Holy Spirit and, and become saved, then you want to do these works. And that goes into the second one. They're, yeah, they're meritorious, but you don't do it for the merit. You do it because you want to be more Christ. Yeah. Can you be a Christian and not have works? Was that what Jesus was talking about when he talked about the lilies of the field? Consider the lilies, uh, how they... No, they that's, not. that's more in the vein of they're not striving for existence. I see. Um, they exist, God takes care of their needs. So it's kind of, that's more that. Well, I think you can be a Christian and not have works. Um, and, you know, but you couldn't be a Christian and do bad works, I don't think. Because that would be ugly. Well, being a man, to works is physical labor. And uh, there are people who cannot do physical labor. <laughs> so, the, you know, the problem is, is you argue all the way around this, and then there's one character in the Bible that shoots every argument in the foot. You know who it is? The thief on the cross next to Jesus. This day you shall be with me in paradise. He can't do anything. But he has done something. But, you know, he doesn't have correct Christology. He doesn't know perfectly who Jesus is. He uh, doesn't know, you know, the perfect formulation of the Trinity. 
He has not heard Jesus for these three years, and yet Jesus says, this day you'll be with me in paradise. But then James says, uh, you cannot have faith without works. For what good is your faith if a brother or sister comes to you and is naked or thirsty or tired and, and you don't offer them food or drink or a bed? Show me your faith apart from good works and I'll show you dead faith, essentially, is what it says. Or are we going to toss something in? Yeah, there's a, I think it's something Paul wrote. It's about being judged on how you build on the foundation. Jesus Christ is the foundation. And then we're supposed to build on the foundation. And uh, at the end, when the fire yeah, it's in, it, it's Paul. So at the end, when the day of the Lord comes, fire comes, and if you've uh, built upon Jesus' foundation with gold, you're rewarded because the gold doesn't melt from fire. But if you build on the foundation with straw, then you, then it's, you're still saved, but you're not rewarded because what you built is gone. So, you know, that sort of speaks against uh, you have to have some sort of works. But then again, all Jesus says is, believe and follow me. Yeah. I'm, I've always been a believer. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Luke 12, 24. And uh, it's going to be outward appearance of what's on the inside. So that's... Yeah. So in the, if you want to know, like, the biggest sticking point between the Protestant church and the Roman Catholic church, besides the fact that we don't have a cemetery, is that a Roman Catholic is going to tell you you have to have good works to be saved, and a Protestant is going to tell you sola fide, by justification, by grace through faith alone. That's the phrase, by grace through faith alone. Um, so when a Roman Catholic says you have to have good works, typically what they mean is Yes, you are saved by grace, but that must have an accompaniment of good works with it. And then a Protestant will say, no, you are saved by grace through faith alone, and then because you've been saved by grace through faith alone, and you are regenerated, and you are built more into the image of Christ, then you will start to do good works. And you say, then how is that really that different? And I say, I don't know, but we've been divided over 500 years. Um, so, by grace through faith alone, that's the big thing. John, let's say at this point um, in his life, he's trying to prove that he's saved by his works, essentially. But the problem is, is that he later in his life said that no one can do anything good before you're justified. Everything you do before you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior is evil. And you go, oh, that seems a little harsh. And he would say, well, it's about your... Um, about your, uh, you know, no, no one has a perfect track record. No one has a perfect, I'm doing this for you, and I know I'm not going to get any kind of reward out of it because it makes me feel good. Well, that feeling good, you're still doing it for a reason, it's not necessarily a good work. Um, circular logic, but. Uh, and then he's also influenced by the man named Peter Bowler, who was a Moravian, and Wesley's struggling, he's struggling, he's struggling, he thinks he's going to walk away from the church, and Peter Bowler gives him this quote, which is, I love it, which is, preach faith until you have it, and then because you have it, you'll preach faith. Fake it till you make it. Um, but Martin Luther, again, taught sola fide, justification by grace through faith alone. Uh, oh, I wrote justification by works alone. Whoops, that's wrong. <laughs> um, and so he rejected that Roman Catholic uh, belief of uh, you have to have works and you have to have grace to be saved, excuse me. Um, so the way the GMC Catechism puts it is this, can we have faith without works? No, we believe that good works are the necessary fruits of faith and follow regeneration, but they do not remove our sins or allow us to avert divine judgment. So it's grace through faith alone in Jesus Christ and Satan. Boom, there it is. This far away from that, is this belief in regeneration. We'll talk about this more later. Um, that you are regenerated in some ways into the image of Christ. Because of these moments, boom, slightly askew to that, you can now do good works. You should now want to do good works. You should now um, intentionally practice good works. The good works not which saved you, but it is a necessary outflow 
of the faith. Now, Wesley, I believe, held that at the final end of all things, there would be a second justification, a second moment where you stood before God, everybody was held to account. And in that moment, you could have said, yes, I'm a Christian, but never showed the fruit of it. And then now you stood before God and you weren't. You're not saved because you had no outflow of works. Most theologians, when they read that, are like, huh? Because they have no clue where he got that from. Because um, I remember reading one of my professors who talked about it. And he said, yeah, I'm not going to spend time on this, even if we don't understand this. <laughs> uh, so I just gave it to you to make you confused. Uh, anyway, so Aldersgate Gate is, is, this is kind of the moment that Wesley's life starts to coalesce. Wesley experiences assurance at Aldersgate, Gate, but he continues to struggle for the rest of his life. So on May 24, 1738, he says, In the evening I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street, where one was reading Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans. And about a quarter before nine, while the leader was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warm. He said, I felt that I did know Christ as my Savior and that I was saved. And so once he found this moment of assurance that Okay, it's not my works that save me. It's my faith in God that has saved me. God's spirit testifies to my spirit. I am his child. He starts to build up this network of societies for the purpose of building one another up to do good works and to love God. And so uh, at this period, you have these societies that it's like the Grosbeck Women's Club or the Grosbeck Gardens Club or the Lions Club or, you know, to an extent, the Masons. It's just an organization that you can go be a part of. But the purpose of this is to not be church, but to be a group of Christians who work together for good works and who work together to hold one another accountable in their faith. So you don't have communion, you don't get baptized, you don't have a Sunday service here, but this might be more like Wednesday night church, if that helps. That's what the society he's building on. He is still Anglican. He dies Anglican. And he does not want to start a new denomination or a new church. He wanted to build a church which, or excuse me, a society which would uh, basically serve to uh, reinvigorate and reform the Anglican tradition. Kind of like Luther didn't really start off just trying to chuck the Roman Catholic Church. He started off trying to reform the Roman Catholic Church. And when he was labeled a heretic for it, he said, okay, I can't really do anything at this point, so he started the Lutheran movement. So uh, Wesley starts to plant these societies all over England, and then eventually up into, even to Ireland and some other places, and he's building and he's building and he's getting all these different people, uh, and he's traveling throughout the UK on horseback, and as he's building up these societies, he eventually gets other, usually lay people, not priests, who want to help him with these things. Well, great. So they aren't priests. They can't perform the sacraments, but they're traveling preachers, itinerant preachers. They move from place to place. And Wesley says, okay, Gordon's got to go to, you know, Cossey, uh, Thornton, Grosbeck, Mart, and Mahaya as part of this circuit. And then he'll do this circuit for so many months or a year, and then I'll move him to a new circuit. And then I'll take this pastor who was over here and move them to this circuit. And he was just constantly moving all these pastors and preachers around. And occasionally he'd have priests that could perform the sacraments. So they would go in and they would do it for that society, but not, not super often. But as you get more and more people, they don't want to go to the Anglican church anymore. The Anglican church didn't help them. So they started going to the Methodist church on Sunday morning, and it became more of a church. And then all of a sudden, sacraments are a problem. My baby needs to be baptized. Who's going to do it? You know, I, we need communion. Who's going to give us communion? Um, so you have all these traveling preachers that are trying to go and fill a role. So Grosbeck, this church, was... I disagree with uh, Myrna Cantrell a little bit. She wrote a history of our church. She says this church was uh, established in 1871. Well, the circuit was established in 1871. The, the Grosbeck circuit. Um, I was reading through the book the other day, and I thought it was interesting. One of the original circuit members of the Grosbeck Circuit gave a parcel of land that was about 600-something acres, and it became the city of Mart. So Mart was a part of 
the gross spec circuit that actually exists in part because of the circuit. I think that's kind of cool. Uh, Cosi would have been part of the circuit probably. Basically limestone county, roughly, would have been that circuit. And then in 1874, this church built its first church, and that's where probably this church really took the structure of a local church. It wasn't meeting in people's houses or in farms or, you know, at uh, outdoor tabernacles anymore. Um, and so that's where you kind of had the differentiation of now you have a pastor going to set churches instead of just set people's houses. And they start to organize into, uh, you know, incorporated businesses and, and things like that. Um, if you want to copy of that book, it's a fascinating book. Um, and I, we have some up in the blog here. Um, so anyway, so eventually sacraments become a problem, and you have this uh, bigger problem called the Americans. And the American War for Independence, basically the Church of England says, great, if you're going to rebel, all the priests have to come back. You don't get the sacraments anymore. You're going to die, and you're just going to be buried, and no one's going to help you. Or you're going to get born, and you're not going to get baptized, and no one's going to help you. You don't get communion anymore. Um, and so the Americans send letters to John Wesley and say, we need a priest. We need somebody. And Wesley can't send an Anglican priest. So what he does is he ordains uh, Thomas Coke and Francis Asbury as superintendents to kind of superintend the work of the Methodist Church in America. But when they got to America, they gave themselves a new title. Does anybody know what it was? Bishop. So the Methodist Church in Britain doesn't have bishops. They have superintendents because they follow John Wesley. We have bishops because Thomas Coke and Francis Asbury said we like that name better. Uh, <laughs> so they go to America, they start to ordain others, and then now you have the Methodist Church in America is the first Methodist Church that is separate from the Anglican Church. Um, and, you know, you've got to have a really stout ministry. If you only have the priest or the pastor coming to your church once a month, somebody's got to stand up and talk on Sunday morning. Somebody's got to be leading you throughout the week when things are going wrong. And so you have this really huge network of lay ministry. So um, at one point in this annual, or in the Central Texas Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church, there was a rule, you moved pulpits every four years. Period. End of story. You're done. Um, the reason being, the idea is, if a pastor is constantly moving, you have a stronger lay ministry within that church that the pastors can come and go, the church remains strong. It's a great idea. We live in America, though, and we have been so infected by corporate culture that the pastor a lot of times is more like CEO and vision caster, and it's hard to have one pastor's vision for four years, and then they leave, and then you have a new vision for four years, and then they leave, and then a new vision. Um, especially when it takes about 18 months just to develop trust with people. That's what they tell you in seminary anyway, is that when you go to a church, you have to have 18 months to really have a congregation's trust. Um, sometimes it happens quicker, sometimes it happens longer. That's just what it does. Um, so you, you keep getting moved around, but if you're moving all these people around, everybody's all over the place, Wesley's constantly moving them, well, you have to have a time and a place set for when they will meet together. And that becomes the annual conference. They meet together. They talk about things. They talk about their theology. Wesley corrects them, because he often did. And uh, then they kind of you know, get their new appointments and move on. So again, in this annual conference, or the United Methodist Annual Conference in like the 70s, into the 80s, I think, um, there was, uh, if y'all know Susie Altland, Susie Altland's dad was the pastor here at one point. And what they would do every year was when you go to annual conference, you packed up the entire parsonage, you drove to Waco for the annual conference, and then you found out at the end of the three-day conference whether you were going back to the church you'd been at or you were driving to a new church. Oh, and quite literally, you would just find the other people in the room and you'd go, here's the keys to the parsonage, and then you'd, you'd, you know, you'd try to find the other person to get the keys. I mean, that's literally how it worked. Uh, and that's how important these annual conferences were. Funny story about Wesley, when he built his first 
chapel in Bristol. It's called the New Room. Um, he builds this chapel, and in the middle is this beautiful cupola, and it's got all these windows letting all the sunlight, and there's one extra little window, and on this one extra little window, there's a direct view from Wesley's private apartment down to the pulpit. Because he would watch the preachers, listen to them, but not go into the room, because, you know, sometimes his presence could cause a little bit of a stir. And then he would critique them savagely, because he didn't like what they had to say. <laughs> <laughs> so they never knew what, you know, angels and miraculous would listen. Um, and the, the way Wesley developed these societies was you have the society, so the large corporate gathering that becomes the church. You have the class meeting, which is... You know, six to twelve people, most of the time gendered, male or female. Um, possibly you could have couples. But the, the purpose of that was personal growth within the context of intimate fellowship, accountability for spiritual stewardship, bearing one another's burdens, and speaking the truth in love. And the only condition for those who wanted to be part of the class meeting was a desire to flee from the wrath to come and to be saved from their sin. So you could be a part of this class meeting that built you up as a Christian, but if you wanted to go to the society meeting because there was communion, you had to have a ticket from your class leader. And you would talk and, and they would see how you were, they would discern how things were going in your life, and if they felt like you were in a state of grace and you were uh, uh, following the Lord as your Savior, all these different things, they would give you a ticket, you could go to uh, the society meeting, and you could have communion. And if you did something wrong, or you weren't telling people the truth or whatever, they would take your ticket away. <laughs> and you weren't allowed into the society. Um, and then they had, finally, the band meeting. And a lot of times these tend to be, you know, uh, Bobby and Gordon, gosh, they're just so terrible. So we're going to take Melvin and uh, we're going to take Jack, or Joe, excuse me, and we're going to take all four of them and we're going to put them into a band together. And their job is to now just work on dealing with sin and dealing with all these issues that are coming up. And then we'll probably take somebody like Bob, who's a more, you know, who's an older Christian, a little bit more experienced in the faith, to kind of lead them through that time. Uh, so this was the question you had to answer at, uh, this isn't the band meeting, this is the class meeting, I wrote that wrong, I'm sorry. Uh, 21 questions. I know it looks small, it's because this is the only way I can fit it on here. Uh, Am I unconsciously or consciously creating the impression that I'm better than I am? In other words, am I a hypocrite? That's question number one. How are you feeling? <laughs> hey, question number two. Do I, am I honest in all my acts and words? Do I exaggerate? Do I confidentially pass on to another what was told me in confidence? Can I be trusted? Am I a slave to dress, friends, work, habits? Uh, did the Bible live me today? Am I enjoying prayer? When was the last time I spoke to somebody about my faith? Do I pray about the money I spend? Uh, do I go to bed on time and get up on time? Uh, am I defeated in any part of my life? Am I jealous, impure, critical, irritable, touchy, or distrustful? How do I spend my spare time? Am I proud? Do I grumble and complain constantly? Uh, is Christ real to me? Here's my ticket. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a class meeting. You have to answer these. Yeah, to get your ticket to go to the society meeting. You have to answer all of these truthfully. Well, mine is yes, but it's my medication. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, hard thing is, Methodists didn't grow a lot quickly because, you know, who wants to answer that? <laughs> Opposite side, when you have people who are super serious about their faith, who want to love the Lord their God, who are following Christ daily, who are serious about Bible study, and who you can be open and honest with and truthful about everything in your life, that's attractive. So it's interesting, you know, some of the fastest growing churches in America aren't the churches that don't require anything of you. It's the churches that require a lot of you. I mean, churches that say, yeah, if you're going to type, like, tell us how much you make. Or if you're gonna, uh, if you're gonna be here, then before you get married, you should go talk to somebody and ask them if you're even allowed to marry this person and go through counseling. Crazy things. Um, but people, especially younger people, don't like hope so, think so, maybe so, faith. 
They want a hard faith. They want community, right? Because this thing is not community. It's never been community. Um, so the band meeting questions, and these the smaller groups, um, what, sin, what known sins have you committed since our last meeting? What temptations have you met with? How were you delivered from them? What have you said, thought, or done in which you doubt whether it was sin or not? And are you keeping any secrets? So not only are there people who would know, you know, generally how you're doing in a large sense, now there are people that know all the dirty stuff about you. But you know all the dirty stuff about them. And so this builds trust in the community, and people found this really enticing. I mean, I talking about it to me is is really interesting and makes me want to dig into it because all of a sudden you're not just sitting there like hi how are you church you know these people you know them well you know where they're struggling you know where things are going really well and when you all of a sudden know those things what happens now you're in your relationship with them now you can work together better now you have more empathy for them and more sympathy for them they have more for you you don't just have Oh, yeah, I've been to the same church for 40 years, and I don't know who sits on the other side. No, I know everybody, and they know me. And, and we're in serious community together, really a lot like the apostles were. And so that's, that's kind of how this movement was growing, and, and lots of big things were happening. And eventually, uh, in 1791, Wesley died. And his final words were, the best of all, God is with us. So at his death, he had not allowed it to become a separate church, but Methodism was becoming a denomination. They had pastors that they were ordained by themselves. They were doing all different kinds of things. Um, and American Methodism had actually, not completely, but in a large sense, gotten rid of Wesley's leadership. Because after the American War for Independence, who really wants this British guy telling you how you have to keep running your church? And so I remember that one of the letters... They called him our dear Uncle John from across the pond. <laughs> yeah. Um, and probably the biggest thing we have ever heard, this is the question I'm just going to end with. This is the question the Methodists are famous for, is how is it with your soul? Who are the people that you can go to and you can ask this question, how is it with your soul? And the answer, honestly, who are the people that you can say, here's my successes, here's my struggles, and here's my sins? Uh, in Wesley's day, to be a Methodist was to have those people and have that built together. In our day, we really largely moved away from that. And what's interesting is if you look at the rise of Methodism in America, I mean, it's just shooting up. And then what happens is there's so many people, and it's hard to maintain control over everything, that band meetings stop and it slows class meetings stop, the plateaus, society meetings aren't mandatory anymore, you don't have to have a ticket, and Methodism starts to run. Because all of a sudden, it's like any other church. It's like any other denomination. And it's only so interesting. So that's a, a generic history of the Methodist movement uh, in John Wesley's life specifically. Like I said, uh, next time, no class next week, uh, next time we're going to talk about Wesley's understanding of the different forms of grace. Uh, anybody have any last uh, questions, comments, concerns before we wrap up tonight? I know I'm sorry, I'm four minutes over. <laughs> I, try to, I try to honor y'all's time, not on Sundays, but on today, I do. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Jesus, thank you for today, thank you for your goodness, uh, and thank you for a fallible man named John. God, thank you for the things we can learn from him and the ways that we can see your goodness uh, through his study, through his devotion, uh, and God, even through his struggles. Lord, would you help us to just keep going through this class with strength, uh, to learn things, to be excited about all that you have for us, and God, to just give you all the honor and glory. And God, we know that information enough is not alone. So God, we seek your transformation. It's in Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. See you all Sunday. If not, before. Thank you.